Hi everyone, um, my name is Lilia Björk uh, and I'm uh, an archaeologist with the Institute of Archaeology in Iceland. Um, and I'm going to tell you about um, this project that I've been doing with, with some collaborators uh, um, on a site that is rapidly eroding uh, and how we've tried to rescue information and uh, involve the community uh, as we go along. So, first an overview. Um, I'll start by giving you an overview of the location. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Iceland or, or this region which uh, the site is on. Um, and then I'll give you a historic account, a background of the site, and then uh, how the site relates to the community and some of our research, out outreach um, efforts. So, uh, sorry, there we are. This slide shows the location of the site. It is situated on the tip of, of Snæfellsnes Peninsula on the west coast of Iceland. It is close to the volcanic glacier Snæfellsjökull, uh, which many know, know as the place where Jules Silverne claimed the entrance to the center of the earth was. It is within the boundaries of a national park that covers the area surrounding the glacier. The first mention of Gufuskaular in written sources is in 1274, although archaeological remains indicate that we might have a Viking Age uh, material there. The first mention of a fishing station on the site is in the mid-15th century, when the fishing seems to be at its high point at Gufuskaular. Fishing on a large scale continues at Gufuskaular into the 17th century, but after that it declines rapidly and the activities become more related to farming until the mid-20th century when the farm is finally abandoned. Um, so fishing sites can be found all over Iceland. Um, they're usually set up as close to the fishing ground as possible. Um, <coughs> many of these sites are at the mouths of fjords or on islands uh, and some of those sites have continuous history of fishing through centuries, with many of the most successful ones turning into small villages. Uh, other fishing stations were abandoned as bigger boats with engines made them obsolete. Because of their location, those sites are now in danger of eroding away. Uh, and on the slide you can see the uh, slipway, I believe you call it, here, at Gubuskaular. There are late stones and there are keel marks on these stones all the way out. It's a 70 meter long slipway. And the boats are similar to what they would have used at Guruskollar. So the start of the current research project was when a local in a nearby village raised awareness of an archaeological site to the National Park of Snæfellsjökull, and that the site was being damaged by sea erosion. Up until that, not much was known about the site, although it had been specially protected in the 1960s. It was mainly protected because of the kill marks in the slipway, as well as for unnumbered stone built jets in a nearby lava field. Locally, mounds with archaeological material falling out of eroded sections had been known for years, and people have been collecting loose finds at the site for at least 50 years although publicly the site remains uh, fairly unknown. Uh, you can see here, this is um, a structure, which I will show you later, but this is how it looked when we came to the site. So badly eroded there. So when I became involved, I saw a huge mound with erosion scars and an abundance of material eroding away, mostly fish bone. Following that, in 2008, we started by cleaning back and recording the biggest scars. It turned out that the site was much larger than previously thought, with extremely good preservation for organic material and structures. And as you can see on the uh, fish bones there, they are, like they've been dropped there a few months ago. 
We returned in 2011 when the people at the City University of New York became collaborators on the project, providing both financial support, manpower for fieldwork and analysis of the faunal remains. We've been coming back every summer since with an international team from Iceland, UK, USA, Canada and Norway. Uh, this is the research area. It's quite big. Um, it reaches from here all the way up to the lava field, which is here, and a little bit further out. And, and all of this is eroding. As you can see on the photo on the right, structural stones and mitten deposits are being torn off by the sea. Although most of the archaeology by the coast is being eroded by the forces of the sea, further inland, wind erosion is an increasing problem. Studies of aerial photography suggest that in the period between 1984 and 2015, due to wind erosion, as you can see there on the, on the left, uh, the erosion line has moved back uh, at least 10 to 12 meters. And growing tourism is also something that we worry about. The research has mainly been focused on two mounds by the shore. Since 2008, we have recorded sections and made test trenches along the coast, as well as in the farm mount, which is a little further northeast. This one, you can see here, is the largest of the mounds by the shore, <coughs> called the Queen Mount. It's about four meters high and is mostly man-made. A trench was dug on the sea-facing side. A large part of that site is badly eroded and several structures can be seen in the sections. In 2012, we discovered an entrance to a building in our trench. We believe that it is the entrance to a structure falling out of the section. In, in small photo, this is the entrance. And we could see the entrance was up here in our test trench and this is the structure. It is gone now, but at least we have it. We had the entrance. Currently, we don't know if we will be able to continue studies on the Queen Mount uh, due to uncertain funding and permissions. Uh, this site is, like I said before, specially protected, and therefore any excavation is forbidden, except for the ones that we got were allowed to do because this was actually falling in the sea. So in the summer of 2012, uh, we opened a bigger area uh, around the structure that I showed you earlier. This is a 15th century fishing booth, which was used seasonally. It forewent many changes during that time it was being used. All floors were very thin and were separated with the Aeolian sand, which just seasonal use. According to written sources in the 15th century, each of the 14 ship crews at Guberskala had their own booth. So we could expect at least 13 more of these structures around the site. Little is known about these structures before the 18th century, and that, by that I mean fishing boats, uh, but many accounts and descriptions are known about them after that time. And this is the fishing booth after we had uh, opened it up. You can see the erosion line right there. Was here actually, and uh, and a little bit further this way, there was also some more erosion. Some very fine artifacts were found within this booth: several gaming pieces, ceramics, copper alloy objects, fish hammers, and line sinkers. And this booth was fully excavated in the summer of 2014. However, when we finished excavating the booth, earlier structures appeared beneath it, which was a bit of a surprise, because we could see the bedrock out there, and we thought that we might be down to bedrock, but no. It seemed to be a building with multiple rooms that extend beyond the current limits of excavation. As you can see from the photos, the erosion was closing in on two sides, so it was in a real danger of disappearing. So again, here is the erosion line, uh, and then here also. During last winter, Iceland had many bad storms, as, as um, other countries here in the north, uh, and was hit very badly. 
the Guru Scholar. So we lost entire rooms uh, and rooms that we hadn't excavated yet. Now, this one we took at the end of, of the 2014 season. Uh, we put sandbags, um, big stones, all of the soil down there to try to stop the erosion. Uh, we filled all the rooms with sandbags to support the walls, uh, but no such luck. Uh, when we arrived this year, um, we had lost everything in this part. Like, this room was gone, this wall was gone, and this was badly gone either. And of course, all the uh, accompanying deposits. But we were still able to get some information and find during the summer season, despite having lost walls and connections between floors and doorways. As we finished only two weeks ago, all post ex work is still to be done, so we don't have reliable dating yet on these new rooms. But we do know that the, uh, the one on top of this was 15th century, early 15th century. So why is this site important? Centuries of fishing and farming have left, have left abundance of evidence on the lives and works of hundreds of people who played various roles at various times at Guvuskalar. With large farm mounts and numerous other, other ruins, Guvuskalar offer a unique chance to look at the farm from its beginnings in Viking Age or early medieval times through to its end in the mid 20th century. Another factor in the importance of the site is the incredible preservation of animal bones which are literally falling out of the sections. Perfectly preserved otoliths are found in almost every deposit excavated and fish scales have been retrieved from deposits dated to the 15th and 17th centuries. Um, so like I mentioned before, we have had some really nice finds. Um, most of them are related to fishing, but uh, we also have some decorative finds like that nice ring um, this uh, beautiful bone needle was also found this summer and we believe that this CU alloy was uh, cast on site because we have found um, casts not for this one particularly but we have found casts on site and uh, a lot of CU alloy cuttings, small, thin ones So, to give you some sense of the area and its community, here you can see a map of the Snæfellsnes Peninsula. It's about 100 kilometers long and 15 to 30 kilometers wide, depending on where you are. There are a number of villages along the coast where life mostly revolves around fishing. And Gruvuskaular is here. There are two fishing villages here, one here, and two small ones over here. The rest, this is national park and people don't live within it. In addition, there are no numerous farms in the lowlands on the southern coast. The total population of the area is only around 4,000 people. But that is not all because it is as estimated that almost half a million tourists, both Icelandic and foreign, go through the area each year, mostly during the summer months, which are only two or three, if we're lucky. The majority of them pass by the Gubuskaula site. Several ways have been used to raise awareness of the site, its importance to the history of Icelandic fishing and fishing communities in the past. One reason we do this <laughs> is to secure more funding for the eroding archaeology, but also because we want to share what we find with all who are interested, especially the local communities. Many guests show up on sites every day to inquire about our work. Everyone is given a chance of a tour on the excavation area and time for questions. We also have scheduled and advertised open days in cooperation with the National Park, where finds from each year are on display and site formation is explained in pictures. We've also given talks in nearby villages that are open to everyone. We try to keep both the local and national media interested by informing them on our progress and new discoveries. We also use social media like Facebook and Instagram, which we update several times a day during field season. 
The local elementary schools have seen the opportunity in using the information gained by the research team. Last week, uh, all of the staff of three local schools came to Gubbeskaular for a tour of the site. The reason was to prepare the teachers for a class they call Aftagatimar, or Our Local Environs. In these classes, students from the ages of 6 to 15 will learn about their environment, including archaeology, history, geology, biology, etc. In the coming weeks, the students will, learn, will have lectures from an archaeologist, me, on Guvuskaular and erosion, how it affects the archaeology and why it is important. They will also be taught how to spot archaeology in a landscape, as well as how to behave on an archaeological site, not least ones that are eroding with artifacts scattered around. There is no tradition in volunteers or volunteering in archaeological work in Iceland, but with growing awareness of the danger erosion causes to our fragile coastal archaeology, people outside the field have begun to fight for funding and actions to save our heritage at risk. This is a true bottom-up work where a group of people passionate about the heritage has managed to start a collaboration with the Icelandic Archaeological Heritage Agency about heritage at risk, including holding a conference on the matter last fall. They are all very much looking to the work of the Scape Trust and rely on their experience and knowledge, not least in getting the local communities involved with monitoring eroding sites. Talking to the visitors, it has become clear that there are three main groups. First, the general tourist. He mainly wants to know about shiny artifacts and how old the site is. Then we have fishermen that are mainly interested in the catch. That is, what species they were catching, how big was the fish, what kind of tools they had, knives, etc. And last but not least, there are the local people or other Icelanders with roots in the area. They seem to be driven by interest in learning about their ancestors and the place they come from. This is mostly noticeable through the questions as they are more interested in what kind of houses their ancestors lived in and what kind of personal things we have found. We have encouraged them to share stories with us or memories about the site, its history, occupants or its surroundings. We also encourage them to bring artifacts they have found through the years and give us as much information as they can for documentation. Here you can see photos of a couple of the fish heads in the lava field, sitting on top of the moss-covered lava ridges. The heights of those are between one and a half and two meters. Today, there are only three complete ones. Um, we have about 160 of them in total. The others are in various stages of decay. <coughs> We've been able to collect stories and photos of the area from locals and visitors, including these given to us by a woman who, 40 years ago, lived at Guvuskaular and used one of the fishing sheds as her very own dollhouse. This is a picture, a photograph I took in 2009 when I surveyed the uh, sheds, and this is a photograph she sent us to use for this lecture. Uh, this was her dollhouse. And here she is with her sister inside. Although that story is much more recent than the stories we are trying to learn through the archaeology, it gives us some sense of the link between people and the site. So people have been living with the archaeology and each have their own experience and feelings about it. They bring to the table a different experience of the site. This deepens the interpretation of the archaeology because a site such as Gubbeskaular is not isolated, stuck or frozen in time, it has been, but in fact a very living place. Its meaning and importance may change through time, but its involvement in people's lives continues, even though its original purposes is forgotten. 
This conversation between present and past discoveries not only has a meaning to the archaeologist working on the site, but also to the people who have their own memories and feelings about it. As we have discovered, it has given both parties a deeper appreciation of the site Gubbeskalar. Thank you.